Let's begin this morning with prayer, please. Gracious Father, thank you for the promises that you give us so freely through your word, Jesus Christ. As we come to the end of our Lenten journey this year, we again find our focus on the events of Holy Week. And though many of us know this story so well, sometimes we too forget what was done for us on that cross. Some of us too forget the necessity and the intentionality of the cross. We sometimes see these events as something that was imposed upon Jesus by the people instead of seeing these events as the fulfillment of your long proclaimed promises for our salvation. As we hear these words of Jesus today, help us to better see and better understand what Jesus willingly went through for us to bring forgiveness of our sins. Show us again by the power of your Holy Spirit how these words apply to us and how they are promises given for us. Please remove all distractions from among us that your word might have free reign in this place. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our rock. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A few weeks ago, if you recall, we talked about the beloved Apostle Peter and about the terrible affliction that he suffered from, foot and mouth disease. Yes, Peter's noted for his tendency to say out loud exactly what was on his mind. There not really did not appear to be a filter between Peter's mind and his mouth. But he blurts out, and what he blurts out is exactly the same thing that the other disciples were thinking. And if we're truthful with ourselves, Peter is speaking what is on our minds as well. You may recall in Mark chapter 8 that Jesus had just explained to Peter and the other apostles that he was going to go to Jerusalem, where he was going to be arrested, he was going to suffer and die and rise again from the dead. It was Peter who decided to take it upon himself to chastise and correct Jesus, telling him that these things indeed were not going to occur. He told Jesus essentially that Jesus just didn't have the story right. And then Jesus turns the tables on Peter, putting Peter in his place, saying, Get behind me, Satan. Our reading today in the book of John reveals that, that Peter was not alone in this affliction. This morning we read of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, also known as the sons of thunder, who open their mouths and blurt out the first thing that comes to their mind. Their words reveal that when Jesus was speaking about these things that were, he was going to experience in that very first Holy Week, his impending suffering, his death, and his resurrection, that James and John clearly were not grasping what it was that Jesus was telling them. While Jesus focuses on the cross, James and John focus on glory, their glory making a request for power. James and John say to Jesus, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Now, some of us might think that James and John are making a perfectly reasonable request, but this would have to do with this world's understanding of what glory, what the glory of Jesus is. You see, the proper understanding of the glory of Jesus is found in his own words this morning in verses 33 and 34 of our reading. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. The way of glory for Jesus goes through his suffering and death on the cross. But James and John were not really hearing and understanding what it was that Jesus was saying. Like Peter, they just were not getting it. And Jesus tells them, though, saying, you do not know what you are asking. James and John were thinking what you and I might be thinking, that, that glory means power and honor. 
Makes sense though, doesn't it? That's what this world would have us to believe. But Jesus knew that it meant suffering and shame. The glory of God contradicts the glory of this world. Jesus then asks them, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with, uh, with which I'm baptized? As we read these words of Jesus, it's very helpful to understand them from the Old Testament standpoint as the apostles should have understood them. Take the word cup, for instance. In the Old Testament, the word cup can be a metaphor for many things. First off, we read in Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The cup represents the many blessings which are poured out upon us so freely by the Lord. We read in Psalm 116, uh, the words, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And here, the cup likely refers to the ceremonial drink offering that's lifted before the Lord as commanded by God in Numbers 15. But generally, in the Old Testament, the cup does not contain much that is good. We read in Psalm 11, Verse 6, let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Or we read in Psalm 75, verse 8, for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. And there are many many other examples, but we will remove one more found in Ezekiel chapter 23. These are words to Israel. You have gone the way of your sister, therefore I will give her cup into your hand. Thus says the Lord, you shall drink your sister's cup that is deep and large, and you shall be laughed at and held in derision, for it contains much, and you will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow. A cup of horrors and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. Truth be told, a person was not likely to cheerfully accept a cup of the Lord in the Old Testament sense. We learn a bit more about the kind of cup that Jesus is speaking about when we read in the words of his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prays, Abba, Father, all things are possible for, for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. So the reality of what Jesus was asking James and John is, can you accept the cup of suffering that I will drink? When using the word baptism in our reading, Jesus is again using a metaphor. He's not talking about the baptism which he received in the River Jordan at the hands of John the Baptist. No, the way Jesus uses this word indicates that he's speaking of a future baptism. Jesus is referring to what we might call a baptism by fire. In the context of this sentence, Jesus is using the word baptism as a metaphor for his impending death and resurrection. He is essentially asking James and John, can you endure the baptism of suffering and crucifixion along with me? Now, surprisingly, using the context of the words cup and baptism, James and John give a somewhat unexpected answer. Jesus, as Jesus is asking them if they were able to endure the suffering and crucifixion along with him, they readily reply, we are able. <clears throat> I don't think they really understood what they were saying. You see, they have heard the words of Jesus, and still these two apostles appear to be boldly saying, yep, we are willing to take that cup too. I think that Jesus' reply to them is astonishing. He says, the cup that I will drink, you will drink. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. The reality is that James and John and all of the other apostles for that matter, 
did join Jesus in their suffering. And except for Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him, all of the other apostles, as far as we know, spent time in prison for their faith. And church history tells us that each of the remaining apostles, minus the apostle John, died as martyrs for their faith. And John eventually died too of natural causes, but church tradition leads us to believe that in his lifetime, his enemies tried to poison him, and they tried to boil him in oil. The apostles did indeed drink of the cup of suffering and death while they lived out their lives here on earth. And throughout the centuries, millions of Christians have drunk of this cup as well, dying for their faith. Even now, worldwide, and especially in areas controlled by Islam, Christians continue to drink this cup of suffering. Jesus continues, but to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Jesus tells the disciples that they will indeed suffer for their faith, but those who would ultimately be at his right hand and at his left were already chosen, as we read in the narrative of the crucifixion found in Mark chapter 15. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, King of the Jews, and with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. There you have it. The two men who sat with Jesus when he came into his glory were common criminals. And we know nothing else about them. We don't even know their names. James and John and their ignorance were asking to take the place of these two common criminals. Like I said, they just didn't get it. But the other ten didn't get it either. The scripture tells us that the others began to be indignant. And they were also thinking of the earthly glory that they were expecting from the Messiah. All 12 of the disciples struggled to make themselves the most important in the group. All 12 struggled for earthly power. And it's no different with us, though. So many of us fail to see the glory of Jesus as his suffering and his death and his resurrection. We read in Romans chapter 6, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him like a death in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. But human nature hasn't changed at all. People still fight over who's in charge, who has the most power. We read in James chapter 4, what causes quarrels and causes fights among you? Is it not this? that your passions are at war within you, and you desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. I think that these words pretty accurately describe that little self-centered person inside of each of us, that little dictator who wants to be in charge. But here's the blessing for the apostles and for you and me. Jesus did not have a problem with his role as a servant. Jesus does not just tell us to serve one another. No, he himself became a servant. We read of the words of Jesus in Mark, whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even as we fail to serve as we should, and even though we fail to follow Jesus' command that we become slaves, he did not fail to become the perfect servant for you and me. And how did he do this? We read in Philippians chapter 2, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There is 
the glory of Jesus, found in his victory through the agony on the cross. We read in Hebrews chapter 2, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering and death, so that the grace of God might take death for everyone. In our reading today, we hear Jesus tell the disciples that he would not only serve with the suffering and death, but he would also serve by rising on the third day. Through his resurrection, Jesus certified his perfect service. That is, his role as a perfect slave in order to offer us perfect salvation. Even though we still fight for power over others, we find that Jesus still forgives because Jesus died for that sin as well. Jesus forgives our self-centered search for power and glory. To all who believe on his name, he freely gives the salvation that he won with his glorious victory on the cross. Jesus still gives us a cup to drink and a baptism with which to be baptized, but because he offered himself up as the perfect slave, we will not have to drink the cup of God's wrath. Jesus has taken this cup for us already. Instead, we will drink of the cup of salvation. We will not have to endure the baptism of eternal fires of hell. Instead, we receive the baptism of water and word. We will suffer in this life, that is true, but our eternal salvation is secure in Jesus Christ, our perfect suffering servant. We, like James and John, want glory for ourselves. We want popularity, we want fame, we want power, we want security, and we want all these other things that serve our own egos. This is a symptom of the sin that's around us and the sin that is in us while we live in this world. But Jesus came for a different kind of glory, brothers and sisters. He came to rescue us from this world of sin by freely going to his death on the cross. And because he endured that suffering and death, Jesus has a glory which is so different from our world's understanding of that word. And Jesus revealed that glory with his resurrection from the grave. And now Jesus offers you and me and all who believe in his name, that salvation. Through the Holy Spirit's free gift of faith. For the scripture assures us that Jesus has given his life as a ransom for many. And brothers and sisters in Christ, that includes you. Now, may the peace that surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And blessings on your week.